When people discuss stealth, especially in relation to aircraft, it's not uncommon to hear them treated as though stealth is some singular thing that a fighter or bomber just has or doesn't. The truth, as truths tend to be, is quite a bit more complicated than that. Let's talk about why it seems to be so hard to build a stealth fighter. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. It really might be best to think of stealth as a spectrum of capability that literally anything can be on, but let's keep our discussion limited to aircraft for today. On the left-hand side, we have the low observable. This is where you'll find famed stealth platforms like the F-117 Nighthawk, B-2 Spirit, and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. On the right, we have the observable. This is where you'll find everything from the B-52 Stratofortress to the Goodyear Blimp. While the complexities of stealth could fill volumes of books, in fact, they literally have, the simplest way to think of it with respect to all that complexity may be this. Stealth is a series of technologies, design and production methodologies, and combat tactics that combine to postpone or limit detection in order to make an aircraft more survivable. Which brings us to our first commonly held myth that most of you would probably find funny anyway, and that's the idea that stealth aircraft are in any way invisible. Of course, they're not. Stealth jets like the B-2 Spirit or the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter do go to some lengths to limit their visual signature, or how easy they are to spot against the backdrop of the sky, but they are certainly not invisible. Contrary to popular misconception, stealth doesn't really even make an aircraft invisible to radar either. In fact, many stealth aircraft are plainly visible on radar designed to leverage certain lower frequency VHF and UHF bands. The goal of stealth, then, isn't always to avoid being spotted, it's more or less about avoiding being shot down. Remember, spotting an aircraft isn't the same as securing a weapons grade lock, or a lock you could use to actually engage the jet. And of course, at long distance, the best way to get one of those weapons-grade locks is to identify the aircraft on radar. That's why the most commonly understood facet of stealth is how it can defeat, prevent, or postpone detection from enemy radar arrays, both on the ground and aboard enemy fighter aircraft. Modern stealth programs take a multifaceted approach to solving this problem, leveraging advanced designs that are digitally modeled to deflect radar waves away from the aircraft, as well as radar absorbent materials to capture the energy of the radar waves that aren't safely deflected. But let's dive into that stealth design first, because having a design that's specifically suited for deflecting radar waves away from your aircraft is an intrinsic part of fifth-generation fighter design, but it might be most easily appreciated in the now-dated F-117 Nighthawk. The Nighthawk's unusual angular exterior represents the best computers of the day could manage when it came to calculating radar deflection, whereas the sleek and smooth F-35 demonstrates just how far our computational power has come in the interim. Today's F-35 Joint Strike Fighter may have more curves than hard angles, but the premise behind the design remains the same. I'll go ahead and quote Harold Carter, who was a senior research science manager at Lockheed Martin's legendary Skunk Works, who worked on the F-35 program. The plane's shape is designed to deflect radar energy away from the source, like a slanted mirror. Its surface is also blended and smoothed to enable radar energy to smoothly flow across it, similar to water flowing across a smooth surface. Once a stealth program has that radar deflecting design, it's time to incorporate the radar absorbent materials, because a stealthy design alone simply won't cut it. The leading edge of most aircraft's wings, their jet inlets, parts of the vertical tail surfaces, and plenty of other parts of a fighter all just tend to produce radar returns, and these elements of a fighter either can't be or have yet to be eliminated by advanced design processes. As a result, you'll usually see radar-absorbent edge treatments over these portions of the aircraft, 
More radar absorbent materials, or RAM, is often incorporated into a honeycomb or similar structure inside the turbofan intakes as well. We get a pretty simple explanation of this in the textbook Introduction to Aerospace Materials, where author Adrian Moritz writes, RAM works on the principle of the aircraft absorbing the electromagnetic wave energy to minimize the intensity of its reflected signal. It's possible to reduce the radar cross-section of a fighter aircraft to the size of a mid-sized bird through the optimum design and application of stealth technologies. And of course, not only is that true, but it may even be a bit of an understatement. The F-117 Nighthawk is famously said to have a radar cross-section of only slightly bigger than a tenth of an inch, with the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter coming in only slightly larger than that. The RAM used by modern American fighters is incredibly important, as it's actually been rated to absorb upwards of 70 to 80 percent of inbound electromagnetic energy. But it's also expensive and time-consuming to maintain, which is part of the immense expense associated with maintaining the F-22 or the F-35. Its inability to manage high heat is also an issue, and it's even been known to limit some fighters' ability to sustain supersonic speeds without damaging its radar-absorbent material coatings. And RAM isn't only important for edge treatments, it's also incredibly important for gaps and seams in the aircraft. And that brings us to a hugely important but rarely discussed element of stealth fighter production, which is the manufacturing process. You see, it's not just the complexity of the math and the expense of the RAM that makes fielding a stealth fighter in any numbers so difficult. One of the most important elements of being able to field a stealth aircraft in any numbers is the ability to build them with extremely tight production tolerances. Even a tiny gap between body panels on a stealth fighter can make it more detectable on radar. So assembling a stealth aircraft can be a painstaking process that requires a great deal of expertise and some incredibly expensive equipment. This time, I'll quote Robert Jones from a piece published by the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. If the aircraft external structural parts are precisely machined to fit together with exceptionally close tolerances, then the stealth requirements can be more easily fulfilled. That is, reduction and near elimination of gaps between structural parts is highly desirable in achieving stealth characteristics of an aircraft. And truth be told, the ability to build aircraft with these incredibly tight tolerances is one of the ways the United States has managed to maintain the stealth advantage, even as national competitors have begun fielding their own stealth aircraft. Once again, stealth is a spectrum, and the tighter your production tolerances, the further to that low observable side of the spectrum your fighter ends up on. As an example, the very stealthy F-22 Raptor was built in the 1990s and 2000s, with manufacturing tolerances of around one ten thousandths of an inch. Now that was incredible at the time, it's even pretty incredible today, but gaps still had to be treated with tapes and caulks and radar absorbent materials, just to maintain the jet's stealth profile. Today, the F-35 is said to be assembled with production tolerances that are tighter by orders of magnitude, but it's still not uncommon to see any potential gaps in the aircraft covered by radar absorbent materials. But believe it or not, we still have a long way to go. Modern stealth aircraft have more than just enemy radar to contend with, and as a result, modern stealth programs take pains to limit a jet's infrared and electromagnetic signatures as well. An easy way to think of an aircraft's infrared signature is that it's the amount of heat the jet produces. The hotter something is, the easier it is to see, track, and potentially shoot down. The problem, of course, is that we power our stealth aircraft by mixing air with fuel and lighting it on fire. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that the explosion that results tends to run pretty hot. In order to mitigate all that heat, stealth aircraft usually house their engines deep inside the fuselage with shrouds around the exhaust outlet to diffuse the heat as it's released. This approach also helps to manage the acoustic and visual signatures of the aircraft, or in other words, how loud it is and how easy it is to spot the afterburner when it's engaged. 
This time, I'm going to quote Beijing's Zeyang Zhu and Jun Huang in a peer-reviewed paper they had published by Scientific Reports earlier this year. The exhaust system of an unmanned fighter not only affects its aerodynamic characteristics and infrared signature, but also affects the electromagnetic scattering characteristics of its tail and sides. Studying the comprehensive design of the exhaust system is of great significance to the infrared and radar stealth performance of an aircraft. And this is where we have to have the inevitable conversation about, quote, stealth aircraft that don't leverage all of these stealth attributes. If a fighter or drone or bomber doesn't effectively shroud their engines, are they not technically stealth? Well, no, it just means that they're lacking these elements of the stealth design, which moves them a bit further to the observable side of the spectrum. Because again, stealth isn't something you either have or don't, it's a spectrum of capability. But even if you've managed all of this, that's still not the end of the story, because modern stealth aircraft also leverage electronic warfare suites designed to interfere with nearby means of detection and even enemy communications. Because even a stealth fighter is still very much detectable under certain circumstances, sometimes being stealth means taking a proactive approach to survivability. Now that you've managed to jam all of this stealth stuff into the same airframe, it's time for us to talk about tactics. You see, American pilots spend countless hours planning out their combat operations to ensure that they're operating at an advantage whenever possible. That means using maps of the terrain, known enemy positions and equipment, and a thorough understanding of your aircraft to plot a course that minimizes exposure to enemy defense systems that may have a good chance at spotting or engaging you. It also means developing plans for how to get out of Dodge if something were to go wrong without flying your $100 million stealth fighter right into the waiting wings of another threat. But of course, I'm not going to ask you to take my word for it. I'll quote Air Force Captain Stephanie Fraioli, who's an instructor and course chief at the F-35A Intelligence Formal Training Unit. Fifth generation aircraft derive low observable properties from five major areas. Radar cross-section, the infrared spectrum, the visual spectrum, acoustic emissions, and radio frequency emissions. Because of these technological advances, these airframes are even more reliant on mission planning for effective employment. This is important stuff to remember. A while back, I had a conversation with famed F-14 radar intercept officer and YouTuber you should check out, Ward Carroll. We were talking about the possibility of within visual range dogfights in a new near-peer fight, and he told me something that stuck with me. Stealth doesn't work against bullets. We have multi-axis missiles now where I can shoot you behind my 3-9 line. Okay, but once you Winchester, meaning run out of those weapons, and you're now in the visual arena, then none of your stealth defenses are working. And you're in an aircraft that can barely go supersonic. Welcome to getting shot down. I feel like Jeremy Clarkson because this is one of the few chances I'll ever have to say on that bombshell ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. And before we go, I want to give a quick shout out to YouTuber Mike Webb. You should definitely check out his channel if you're interested in flying your own plane. I recently had the pleasure of flying with Mike, who's also an incredible singer in the US Navy. He told me as we flew about how he manages to fly his plane utterly for free by using this lease back method that he discusses on his channel. I'll include a link below in case you are interested in becoming your own pilot. And of course, I want to thank Mike and Sam Meek and everybody at Fly Wild for giving me some time in the cockpit of your incredible turboprop conquest. It was a great experience. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.